talking today about the intersection of, of technology and active leisure. Um, and and uh, like Carol said, uh, my name is Brent Young, and I'm the president and creative director of Super 78 Studios. And what we do is create media-based attractions. So that basically what that is, is attractions that use media primarily to tell their stories. Um, I gotta say, first of all, this is a great experience. It's such a wonderful setting. Um, I, I, I just look out here and I'm just amazed at everything. I, I had slept in a log cabin in a long time and I had a little critter who visited me last night. So it's been a lot of fun so far. All right, so I've, I've got to do a little dance because I'm operating two machines at the same time here, so I, I, uh, just bear with me. Um, let's see if this works. Yes. Great. So, convergence. Now, convergence is a term that we use a lot in uh, the technology field, in what we do in new media, and uh, I thought it was appropriate here to talk about convergence and, and how that word works with uh, technology and act, uh, the active lifestyle. Uh, this past Sunday, uh, a gentleman by the name of Felix Bumgarner broke three world's records. Uh, and I don't know how many of you guys got a chance to see that. A couple? Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because I think, I think it, it, there's an interesting story here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there was an event, uh, oh, here we go, uh, by Red Bull. It was sponsored by Red Bull, and it was called Stratus. And the story that they, that they used, the one line to describe the story, was mission to the edge of space and free fall. That was it. What a story, right? We have a guy who gets into a capsule. He floats 130,000 feet above the Earth. He is on a balloon that's 55 stories tall. He opens the capsule up like this. He steps out. He's now the, the man who's broken all records on, on altitude for a balloon, man balloon flight. He steps out and he jumps. He sees this. He jumps. He hits 833 miles an hour to become the fastest man. Uh, un, un, uh, uh, fastest man without any anything uh, propul uh, you know pushing him along. He's the man who does the highest altitude skydive, and he's broken the record for balloon. <coughs> and nine minutes later, after he falls to earth and he's tumbling and spinning, and I'm watching this on the internet. He he sits up and and he's okay and. And it was amazing, but what was more amazing than that, and I'll get this smoother as I, as I go along, was the amount of people that tuned into this show on the internet. There were 8 million live streams of people watching this. The highest amount before that was 500,000, and that was for President Obama's acceptance speech. If you look up in the corner up there of how many video views, see 365 million video views around the world on the Red Bull, on this Red Bull page. I mean, it's incredible. It smashed all records. And I started to ask myself, well, why, you know, why is this? You know, what, what is this sparking? What is this story? Obviously, there's a story here that is really igniting people's imaginations and compelling them to watch. Um, and it's that adventure story. It's the, it's, it's the triumph over adversity story. It's, it's that story that compelled us to watch the moon landings. It's the same story, but it's igniting a new generation of people. And... Um, <coughs> Looking at this, it like here's the technology and extreme active lifestyle, and you see, you know, Red Bull Stratus is over there, and, you know, watching Red Bull Stratus. That's me over there at Starbucks. <laughs> it's technology and no extreme. So, um, you know, I think that that uh, Felix Baumgartner 
Uh, and, you know, he was fulfilling. Oh, this is not. There we go. You know, deep down, again, he was fulfilling the sense of adventure that we all that we all have, the story that we all want to fulfill. And I believe this guy and Red Bull, they're great storytellers. They built up this drama to the point that they had 8 million people, 356 million people downloading this. They truly ignited imagination through story. And they told it in a way that the audience wants to hear it. And they told it in a way that they're ready to receive it. And so one of my themes here today is that it's not about telling great stories, because we have a ton of great stories. The national parks have great, great stories, and there's so many of them. In, in Hollywood, we, we use a term called embarrassment of riches. If your story is too rich and you've got too much story, you need to take it down to that nugget, that thing that, that ignites the passion, that ignites people's imagination. And, you know, the idea is, it's, it's not about telling great stories, it's how we tell them. And here's some great storytellers, obviously James Cameron, what he's doing with film, and Martin Luther King, a great warrior, and, and Steve Jobs through his products and his, his presentations, and Walt Disney through his parks and what he's done. Able to tell great stories and ignite people's imaginations. There's another guy who did the same thing. This guy, George Catton. What he did is he used the medium that, that he had at the time, which is painting. And he went around and he painted these beautiful paintings. And he brought them back east. And he had these salons. And he would describe what he'd seen. And he ignited people's imagination through that medium. And to give you kind of a context of the time frame when he was doing this and when he, when he conceptualized the national parks, this was 1832. And in 1832, they, they laid the first photograph on silver plate. So there was no photography in 1832. This was the medium of, of the, the day, painting. And this is what he used to tell those stories and excite people. And I believe that it was that passion that got so many people excited that actually built all of this. It's that storytelling and that passion. Knowledge which is acquired under compulsion obtains no hold on the mind. Right? So we're all receivers and we have to be ready to receive that knowledge and we have to be ready to receive the story. And I believe that we have um, so many tools in our toolbox now, and so many stories to tell. So we just need to pick the right toolbox, and the right tool in that toolbox, and the story, and marry them together to really be able to excite uh, and ignite the imagination. So, a little bit more about Super 78. Our mission is to create the highest quality, educational, inspirational, entertaining, media-based attractions in the world. Again, media-based attractions are experiences that rely primarily on media to deliver the story. Right? So it would be anything from you know, digital cinema to audio to paintings to murals to whatever you would consider media, but that's your primary delivery uh, method and that's what we do. So we can catch up here. So we worked with some, and, and it was mentioned by Carol, some of the kind of major players in the, uh, in the industry and intellectual properties who work with Universal Studios and DreamWorks and Bush Gardens and SeaWorld um, and World Expo Pavilions and the Audubon and the San Diego Zoo. We, we have a wide range of, of clients. And to kind of stay on the cutting edge, we need to be acutely aware of what our audience, what the current family wants, what kind of stories they want to hear and how they want to hear them. And not only do we have to be aware of 
what they want right now, but we have to be looking five years or ten years out because the investment is so big in some of these attractions that they have to last for ten years. So you can't go there in ten years and go, this is looking really dated. So we're constantly looking at what that next-gen technology is going to be. We take that knowledge and data about our guests and the technology and we marry them to create stories uh, they tell stories, actually tell stories in the most memorable way possible. And these are just some of the, you know, it probably doesn't make much sense, that big contraption in the middle, but I'll get to that. Um, real quick, our uh, trade organization, our industry is very small, and our, our vendor organization is the TEA. Uh, we, uh, I'd like to say that, you know, the people that build the attractions, like myself, it's a, such a small group of designers. These are the same people that work with the park service, that work with uh, the zoos, the aquariums, the same people that build, you know, the attractions at Disneyland, the same people that build the attractions at Universal Studios. We're just passionate storytellers. And, and it's not that we're trying to Disneyfy everything, because that is absolutely not what we do. We respect the stories that you're trying to tell. And we're trying to, we try to be consistent with those stories. So, for instance, if you came to us and said, you know, Brent, we need more revenue here at the uh, Grand Canyon Lodge. Uh, we'd really love to put a, a coaster out there over the rim. That sounds like it would be. We would, 95% of the people I work with and the designers that we work with would say absolutely not. Because that is not consistent with the story you're trying to tell here. And we would work with you to figure out the best way to tell that story. And there could be, there's so many different opportunities now to do that. And we don't need to put hardware out here. We don't need to put something like that to be able to tell those stories. We can hide it in a way that's organic and consistent with the story you're already telling. So again, we do media-based attractions. Oh, they're in theme parks, zoos, aquariums, science centers, museums, and visitor centers around the world. <coughs> um, we create delivery systems to tell stories that have a lasting impact. Uh, large format media married with conveyance systems or ride systems or theaters that you're sitting in, you know, whatever we can do to create the most effective storytelling. And it's because of one of these attractions that I'm actually in this room today, one of these big media attractions that we, uh, that we did, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. Flying Over America. Flying Over America was a project that started in 2009 we were approached by the largest uh, theme park developer in China. And they wanted us to produce an experience that, to go into their parks to really show the beauty of America. They'd gone to see Soarin' Over California at Disneyland, and they loved that experience. They loved the sensation of flight. And they loved seeing all the beautiful landmarks. And, and in you know, true to Chinese form, they wanted it bigger and better, so they didn't want just California, of course, they wanted the whole country. <laughs> and, and what's interesting, uh, it's, it's in Shenzhen, China, which you probably heard because that's where Apple builds its products. And it's a, it's a, a brand new city. The city's only uh, uh, 20 years old, about. It's got 25 million people. And they have a uh, park there called Windows of the World. And Windows of the World is a miniature park. And uh, photography is really important. And, and these miniatures of some of the greatest landmarks and wonders around the world is important because the Chinese don't get to travel. They can't leave their country. They can't get visas. They can't leave. They don't have the money or the finances to leave, so they go in front of these things and they take the pictures. 
So they wanted us to create a, a new attraction that would go into a section of their park, which is America, and they have a Grand Canyon that they've made. They've got uh, a Niagara Falls, they have a New York City, they have, <coughs> they have a Washington DC that they can walk around and take, take pictures of. And this, this uh, tower is huge, it's an elevator all the way up to the top, it's huge. So they, they asked us to create this, and we said, okay, we can, we can do that. We'll, we'll find the conveyance system, we'll find the flying system to give us the feeling that we're up in the air, we can create immersive video we can get the helicopters and we can fly across the United States and we'll put together a list of, of, of these greatest sites in the United States. So we started putting together this list and this, this is us in the helicopter, I'm up above the uh, Statue of Liberty there. And the list included uh, Grand Canyon, Statue of Liberty, Zion, Bryce, Smoky Mountains, Niagara, Mount Rushmore, Monument Valley, Tetons, Yellowstone, the monuments of D.C., New York City, but you see a lot of this stuff, these are the national parks. This is the most beautiful landscapes of the country. And so um, we, we met with them and we said, this, this is our, our location list and this is what we're going to do. And this is actually one of the, uh, this is a shot from the movie uh, of us in the helicopter approaching Mount Rushmore. At uh, the 20 minutes, I guess, in the day where all four presidents are, are, are lit. And we, we said, you know, the issue here is, is not that this isn't going to be great. That we're not going to be able to create the sensation of light. We're not going to be able to capture the landscapes of the U.S. But what we really need to do, do to, be, to be integrated into this story, to have to have this be relevant to your guests, Chinese guests, is they need to know, you know, who are we, why are we here, and, and what did we learn? What is significant about this? Instead of us just flying over the United States, how can we give them some knowledge and make this story interesting to them? Because frankly, my biggest concern was that they would come off the ride yearning to come to the United States. When they see those blue skies, when they see what would be, it, it might make them feel actually worse. There's a lot of national pride there. So how can we tell them a story that, that gets them involved? So we went back and we, we started writing our scripts and we, I, I did a lot of, of, of research on Chinese aviation. And aviation is really important to the United States. Right? We have Warhol and Wilbur, we have a long history of aviation. And talking to our partners, they don't have a history of aviation. Or it's not that they don't, they just don't know their history of aviation. So we found their first aviator, Feng Ru. Six years after Orville and Wilbur flew, this man flew, built his own airplane. He flew in San Francisco. It was in the San Francisco Chronicle. He flew. And then he went back to China and built their first airplane. They didn't know this story. Their first airplane, his first airplane is in the Beijing Aviation Museum in a dusty corner. It's not lit, it's not taken care of, they don't know. So I told this story. I said, this is your first aviator. That's amazing. There's another guy, his name is Tan Gen. Invented the hydroplane. He's Chinese. He also took people on the very first commercial flight in Hawaii. He paid 25 cents and he flew them. Starting a whole industry, worldwide industry. He's Chinese. We didn't know that. So our movie, which is flying over America, both these guys immigrants to America, there's the connection. Right? These two aviators come to America and they take us for a ride. Feng Ru is in front of us. We did a replica of his plane. As you can see, we're flying with him. And we're on board with Tangen, the first commercial pilot, of course. And we're flying with them. And they're learning. So in the pre-show, they learn. They learn about their own past. They learn about their history. There's a story that we're telling them.
That's not just flying over beautiful landscapes, but something that when they walk out of the room, they can take away something. When they get off that ride, they get off the ride and say, wow, that was really neat. And they can tell their friends, did you know about Chinese first baby day? So we thought that was, that was really pretty cool. Here's the Monument Valley. And um, if you want to check it out, it's on YouTube. And amazingly enough, it, it's been, it uh, went viral a couple of months ago, and I think that's how Derek found it. There was something like now over 700,000 views of this video. And it's worldwide, so the comments are coming in from everywhere. And really the comments are, America is so beautiful. Look how beautiful America is. And so we were really happy to be involved in this process, in this, in this project. And so these strange machines are the machines that you actually get into and they lift you up into the, into the screen and give you the sensation of flight. You go up and down vertically, pitch it forward, give you that sensation of wind and the effects to really give you that immersion. There's another picture of it. That's just one of the arms up, I think, of one one of those three legs hanging down there. And here's the, uh, here's the attraction. <laughs> you can see. <laughs> <laughs> they built a Mount Rushmore. <laughs> and they put the entire attraction, what you saw, inside that building. <laughs> and so now people get to walk in front of that and take a picture of themselves of the Mount Rushmore. But it's been hugely successful. Millions of people have written it. Um, so another instance of kind of storytelling and what we do in a, kind of a different, uh, little bit of a departure. This is a little difficult to see. This is the uh, Maritime Mus Museum in Singapore. And do uh, you know anything? Uh, Singapore is growing like crazy. They're uh, very modern, very fast growing. There's an island, a reclaimed island called Sentosa Island, which they're developing. There's, they put their uh, one of two casinos on the on this island, and part of the deal that the government of Singapore made with the developer who built uh, Universal Studios and he built this casino and he built a whole bunch of other stuff was that he needed to build a cultural center also that they needed to do it and they needed to use the best people they couldn't skimp on it it needed to be something. That, that could compete or be better with the Universal Studios, that's right next door. And so they built this, they, they, they had some great museum designers, uh, world-class people, uh, great uh, uh, designers for the architecture, obviously. And they, they had a story, and some of these images are kind of blurry, I apologize. Um, they had a story they wanted us to tell, but it wasn't really a story. They said, we have three elements for this story. We have a golden chalice that's this treasure that we found in, the, in a sunken ship, uh, which is this Dow of Muscat. We want to talk about the, silk, the maritime silk room and maritime merchants uh, during the ninth, uh, 900 or 9th century from China you know, to the Mideast. When I tell that story. And we want a typhoon <laughs> experience. We want to have a typhoon. So, again, we have to go back, do our research. And the, where this was located, it was in the middle of this museum. And there was a museum on the upper level and then there was the world's largest aquarium in, in Southeast Asia on the bottom of it. And so what we started talking about is how to, how to create a bridge, how to create a transition, how to create a, a story that takes you from the museum and then brings you into the aquarium. And so we, we took the first element, which was this, this boat that they had found. And they didn't know how it sunk. They didn't know how the treasures got there. They had no record of the people. So we decided to tell a story 
that was a fictionalized account of how that g might have gotten down there. And because they wanted to use a typhoon, we're going to use a typhoon to, to, to get the ship wrecked. And, and we're going to tell the story about the crew. And instead, instead of telling a, a dry account of you know, what we think might have happened, we told a, an emotional story that had themes that resonated with that audience. And those themes were family and honor. And they can recognize those themes, and those themes go all the way back to the 9th century. And so our story centered around a family, a merchant family, that was, that was charged by the emperor to take a golden chalice to the Sultan of Oman. Though they knew that as soon as they left the harbor, Guangzhou Harbor, and headed out to sea, that there was going to be a typhoon and they were all going to perish. And it was a son, and a father, and an uncle, so it was a family that was going to go out, and there was the honor to do it for the emperor, and they knew they had to do it. So, all right, now what do we do? We've got this story. Well, we're going to send everybody, all the guests, are going to be part of the crew. We're going to put them on this boat. This is the concept art. We're going to put them on the boat, and we're going to send them into a typhoon. And we're going to use every trick in the book to make them feel like they're in a typhoon. We're going to shake the stage. We're going to shake their seats. We're going to send water over the top of the, the railings. We're going, to, we're going to have hurricane fans blowing in their face. We're going to do everything we can. Strobe lights, cold air, fog. We, no expense to make them feel uh, uh, like that they're in this. And then we're going to do something that no one's ever done. We're going to kill them all. <laughs> We're going to sink them all to the bottom of the ocean. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to make this whole thing on an elevated platform that's going to go 35 feet down. It's going to expose a massive 365 degree screen that shows the ship coming down, that shows everything coming down, that shows the chalice coming down. And then we're going to open the doors. The wall is going to open up and reveal the largest aquarium in Southeast Asia, which is going to have a replica of the ship in it. So that's what we're going to do. And we need you to do that in 12 months. <laughs> <clears throat> so we started shooting in Los Angeles. That's us um, on stage with a gimbal and a, and, a, and a very authentic boat that we built. And we had their historians help us with the costumes to make everything consistent. Because again, it's, it's the consistency that makes it real. We need to be consistent with every other part of this story. So we, we wanted to be authentic. We wanted to truly be authentic. We laid out, you know, this is some technical designs, how this is going to work in 360 degrees, where all our robotic projection is going to go, where our set pieces are, are going to go, because not only are we we're going to use projection, but we're actually going to build set pieces of coral, and we're going to project fish, and we're going to have three-dimensional fish in the theater. We're going to have as many in-theater effects to make them feel like they're sinking to the bottom of the ocean. And so when you load into the theater, this is a picture of what it looks like when you load in, there is a tapestry that's projected against the wall. Because at the top level, again, you're loading in from the museum, we're making this still a museum experience. So you walk in and you see this tapestry, and then you find that it's actually a living tapestry, and there's people moving around in the tapestry. And at a certain point, the tapestry disappears, and it becomes Guangzhou Harbor, a photoreal version of Guangzhou Harbor. And we fly down into Guangzhou Harbor. Um, and we have a very sort of realistic setting. Now, this image on my screen is you know, really, really long because it, is, it wraps around you in 365 degrees. Or 360 degrees, sorry. Uh, to really give you the feeling that you're there and that you're immersed in it. And then we go out to sea. 
and we're in a, in a terrible storm, we get caught in a typhoon, we run across some rocks, and here's how the, the show works, right? So we're loading on the upper deck, and that's where it's yellow up top, and then they, the entire platform lowers, and you'll see down where the rock work is. That's where we lower into. And this is what it looks like from the lower level. <coughs> and when we get down there, this is a clear picture. It's filled with smoke, so it feels like we're actually underwater. And it really, it's intense. It's very intense. Matter of fact, I thought it was a little too intense for, for young kids. Because once those doors shut, you can't get out. And once you start sinking and you realize that you're sinking, it's a very eerie feeling. But the idea here isn't just to create this spectacle. It's to, 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 to give them the, the knowledge of, and the, the themes. We, were, we wanted to take that story of that cup and give it life, give it a point, give it some reason, some kind of plausible reason why it was there, but also give those the themes that were really there, were really present, and that are still present, that they could relate to. So, I've got one more thing to talk about. Um, and, it's, and it's this. It's the cell phone. And in our business, uh, in theme parks and museums, aquariums, this is, a, this is something that's a problem for us. And the problem is, is that people come to the parks and we spend millions of dollars on scenery and we spend all this money on area development or we have these amazing aquariums and they're doing this. Kids are walking around like this. And we want them to do this. And I had this conversation this morning with a couple of folks out there about this issue and, and what are we going to do. And we know that this is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. But it can help tell stories. This can be a window. This can be a window to a world. This can take photos and we can share our adventures. But we need to figure out a way to integrate this into what we're doing. Because it isn't going anywhere. Because there's so much money behind this to make this happen. That this is going to stay. And, and I think there's an opportunity there. Because I think we can use this tool to help tell our great stories that we have. We just need to figure out how to use it in a way that resonates with the people. Again, back to, it's not the great stories we have, it's how we tell them. And that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think there's, there's certainly a blend of, uh, you know, how to get that information across. And, I, you know, I think we're going to be challenged by the next generation of kids on, you know, traditional text panels and things where they're not familiar with, with even interacting uh, that way anymore. Uh, you know, we grew up in museums where that was the way that we interact with the world. When we, when we need to explain something, there is a, a blackboard that explains what that is. And no longer is that the case. So you're going into you know, anywhere that kids you know, are congregating and you're finding displays and, and maybe what it is is that there's more interactive display technology that needs to be used, infographics that need to be used. So information graphics, a different way to, to get data across to kids instead of just text on a page, which I think most kids today might just walk past. And so if there's information graphics there that says the same story, that you're getting the same story, but it's told in a way that they're ready to, to see it or that they're familiar with, I think that's the way. And then that serves both needs. You're, you're actually getting you know, a display of, of the information um, and you're not completely removing it, but it's in a way that, that, that you know, the next generation and current generations want to receive their, their data and their information. So Brent, I'm, I'm curious how you, you, you alluded to something in your presentation about not having uh, this experience be a substitute for reality. You 
was talking about the trend of augmenting reality. So it's a building experience. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are about how to, how to use the technology to actually um, open doors for new populations, new audiences to an experience that they could have in a place like the Grand Canyon. How, how, do, you, how do you build the introduction, open their minds to this, but not have a situation where they're just continually connected yep. to Technology yep. and not to what's out there. And, and you know what? It's, it, this was initially when we talked, when Derek and I talked, the first thing I started thinking about was this idea of bridges and building bridges and building transitions. And how do we transition? Because we, people are so familiar with this and so familiar with this and so familiar with all their displays that, and I can tell you from my own experience, it just driving up here last night in the dark, and I mean, it was pitch black out on that road, and there was nobody else on that road. And to, you know, I pulled into that last little cafe there, and they said, Well, you know, that North Rim, that's closed. I'm like, Oh, no, it's open. And I'm thinking, like, Where am I going, you know? And the fact is, I didn't have cell service, and I started thinking, like, Well, what if something happened to me? Uh, how would I get in touch with anybody? So there's there's something real there. I mean, people rely on this. I mean, this is this is a real feeling. So we need to figure out how to transition people away from this so they can experience this. But frankly, I mean, this just I mean, it's a pretty easy sell <laughs> to to drag your. I'm busy looking out past you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's figuring out a clever way to transition people from their technology to, to, to the natural world. And I think we can figure that out. I think we can do that. Right. How about uh, use of technology to overcome the fact that your audience is from many different places, speak many different languages? Are there things that you see being done that yeah. help to make an experience like you've been showing us resonate well with people, whether they're Chinese nationals, or right. visitors from Japan, or visitors from some other nation. Right. Well, uh, obviously there's, you know, we, we had to do uh, these attractions in multiple languages, especially in Singapore, because Singapore is such a multicultural, you know, melting pot. It truly is such a kind of crossroads of the world. And so there's a lot of different languages that are being spoken there. And I think, again, one of the things that we try to do is to minimize the amount of you know dialogue and capture whatever we could with the emotion of the, the characters and also tell the story in a visual way that everybody could understand it. So it's it's not relying on language so much. It's not relying on you know people giving, you know, telling someone a lot of information but it's more relying on the visual storytelling and, and the emotion that comes across to tell that story. There are tools, obviously, that people are working on that, that are, you know, we'll see very soon that we'll be able to do real-time translation of signage. Uh, that's, we're probably going to get to a point where we're going to get pretty close to simultaneous translation of language relatively soon. I, I think our friends at Google are working hard on that. Uh, so animatronic technology, yeah. So um, you know, animatronics is is interesting because they're you know they have their place, and if they're not done well, if you don't you know, and they can be really expensive to be you know to get them to be done well, um, then they kind of fall kind of flat, and I think you know they. Uh, Kids aren't going to respond to them the way um, you might want them to. That being said, I think when you when you mention robotics and animatronics, there's actually kind of another technology that's coming up right now, which is called projection mapping, and that's something that we had done uh, in this in this uh, maritime museum theater, where all the coral down on the, the lower level was actually being project all the texture was being projected instead of actually making the texture on the coral. And that gave us the ability to make 
fish, three-dimensional fish that could actually swim in front of the coral and you wouldn't be able to see the coral texture through them. And I don't know if that's, if I'm making that clear or not, but what that does is give you a very realistic picture or a very realistic feeling that there's fish inside the theater with you and you, it's, a, it's an optical illusion that you know, is, is hard to figure out. Now, that technology, projection magnet technology, and animatronics married together can give you a very realistic face and expression to be able to um, emote and give you a performance so you can map an actor or a CG character onto a just white mannequin face to give you something that now looks fairly realistic. Kind of like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit more advanced than that. Uh, you know, I, there's projection that comes from inside, I think Life Forms does something like that. Um, but we're, this, is, this is all brand new stuff that we're doing, but there is new technology right around the corner that I think is going to make an animatronic, not necessarily all the robotic movements, because again, that's, that's where it gets really, really expensive, is all the, the hydraulics and, uh, and actuators and, and the maintenance. Maintenance will carry on that stuff. So that's why the, the parks have them because they have built-in maintenance people that can go around and fix this kind of stuff. But uh, I think what we're going to see with projection technology on uh, projection mapping on figures is going to blow your mind. Is that uh, similar to the Fusion product? The Fusion Eyeliner? Fusion Eyeliner is another interesting way to, to instead of using a, uh, an animatronics, what Fusion Eyeliner is, is basically a Pepper's Ghost effect. And Pepper's Ghost is you know, that uh, Haunted Mansion effect that gives you three-dimensional uh, an effect of someone on stage now, but what Musion has done is created something where you can't see through the body and it looks much more realistic as if someone's on stage. Uh, the problem with that is it's a very expensive technology because they license it out. Um, and they did something, if you look on YouTube at uh, Tupac Shakur, they brought him back to life, uh, at uh, uh, at a uh, concert festival, and it looks fairly plausible. It looks very realistic. It's all CG. It looks very good, but again, very expensive right now. Let's follow up on that expense issue. Uh, National parks charge a whole carload of people twenty five dollars to stay for seven days. That's a little bit different than the theme park kinds of uh, uh, costs. Right. Do you see? And I, I guess. I ask this because I know that one of your uh, reputation factors is that you found workarounds that don't become super expensive. Yeah. You found applications that you were able to deliver price. I mean, do you see some hope? Oh, or absolutely. Because all of this technology is, is, is dropping in price so rapidly. And it really is, you know, you start with the theme parks so of the Petri dish of all this new technology. That's where 3D projection came from. All this 3D stuff that we see in the theater. James Cameron did his first 3D film in a theme park. It was, it was uh, T2-3D. So that's where he got the bug to do 3D. So we see this all being developed in the theme parks. And then, because, as I mentioned, the same people that do the theme park rides do the museums. They do the science centers. They do the visitor centers. Then we see that technology trickle down into those arena into those uh, venues and I absolutely think that there's technology that will be available or is available today that is affordable and will still deliver a consistent story for you and be modern and be contemporary and, and be able to uh, remain that way for several years. Current, so I'm just wondering, when one invests in that technology, it does build the story or tell the story, and how often, what reinvestment is required to continue to update that story? Right. As technology changes and as audiences' expectations change. Right, and that's a that's a great question uh, because we find that also that happens in in theme parks now, where where people want these black box theaters that they're making, they want a different movie. You know, they hey, I've had this for three years or five years, I don't want to have this anymore. I've got repeat customers here. 
I've got regional people that just keep coming back and coming back and they don't want to see the same thing over and over again. So we have to develop media that goes into these, in new media that goes into these, these venues. And so one thing that I think we're doing now, and it's, it's all new again, is that we're standardizing some of the media that we're generating to work on multiple platforms. So we're doing it right now, we're doing it in a SpongeBob attraction, and it's gonna be a SpongeBob 4D attraction, and it's for aquariums, actually. It's being designed for the aquarium market. So where the first SpongeBob attraction was designed primarily for the entertainment theme park market, this is being designed for the, for the, the aquarium market, and we have a big pollution message in there and overfishing message. And so we're really, you know, we're tailoring it to that market. And we're also making this in, in a variety of formats to be able to be shown on domes, digital domes, at planetariums, and 4K environments, and 2K environments. On, on different displays. So we're, we're recognizing that need, not only the need to update, but also the need to fit it into different venues. Because not everybody has the same flavor of projection, not everybody has the same need. So we're, we're trying to make the, the new attractions that we're doing that will be distributed um, available to people in a wide variety of ways. We're getting close to the end of the panel, but we do have time. If anybody in the audience has a, a question or an observation, Paul Saito. See someone in the back. Just a question. The concept, understand, that you're trying to do is getting, you know, getting the people not looking up and looking down. I mean, is that such a horrible concept if, you know, in the end, it actually brings more visitors to the park, even if they are watching that Netflix at night? At least, if they're here for 48 hours, 36 hours, there's a big portion of their time spent looking at the park and being in right. the park. And I mean, you know, once the roads were paved the parks, and the minute they paved the roads, then visitation was a necessary. I mean, technology keeps changing, and their kids would want to come if they had a bad experience right. the before and they were here. If they didn't have their. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, and I, and I think, you know, that's that's what we're trying to develop is, is this. This, this bridge or, 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 or something that, that doesn't take you completely out of the experience all the time. I mean, I, I think, I agree with you. I don't think you, I don't think the cold turkey is a solution. I don't think that's a solution. I don't think you can just cut them off. And, and that was one of the, you know, the early things at, at, at Disney and what we talked about in the theme park is like, just jam it. Just uh, don't let them see the cell phone. So they have to look at our stuff. You know, that's not what people want when they get there and all of a sudden their cell doesn't work, then they're, you know, the complaints go up, up and up. So they, they want it to work. And uh, so I think we have to embrace it and, and we can't fight against it, but we can offer an experience on that platform that can transition them to what we have to offer here. And I, 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 I'm with you. I, I don't think that you can fight it. I mean, you can't. Eventually, I'm, I'm talking to a guy right now who's, who's working with us as a consultant, and he works for the United States Air Force. He's a drone pilot. And we're talking about the future of drones because right now the FAA is trying to commercialize drones for the United States. And you know, because we're, we do these flying films, one of the things we want to do is get real close to things. You can't get real close to things with a helicopter. So you want to be able to get in there with a drone, but you can't fly a drone right now because it's you, the FAA has no rules and they basically ground everybody for commercial use. But I can see in talking to this guy, not so distant future, where the drones are going to be the cell platforms for everybody. You're going to have these things that are going to be flying around and you're just not going to be able to control it. They're going to blanket the entire world with cell signals. So it's not going to come from the satellites, it's going to come from these little drone platforms all over the place, once they figure it out. So there's no way to, to protect, you know, there's no way to say that it's not going to be allowed. So we should just, you know, figure out how to make it work. Okay, I have a last question. How, oh, we have one more, I'll ask one and then we go back here. 
Will we ever go on a holographic walk with a ranger on the trail? I would love that. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, I, I would say, yeah, absolutely, someday we'll be able to do that. Absolutely. A sky tour? Yeah, I mean, that's you could do today, right? That's something that can be done today. Um, you know, MIT, they're working on holography right now. Uh, there, there will be some day, and it's not going to be that far off. I think technology is changing so fast. It's changing so fast that we're going to see stuff. Like that would be for interpreters, not for Dave, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think we have one question back here. Brad, how close are you to the movie industry in terms of, of the parks being able to be? Movies, movies and music are the two things to reach the generation that you're talking about. And just like Pepsi and Coke and Apple and everybody and their brother, you know, have cameos in, in movies, I would think that it would be a real opportunity to have some of these amazing movies filmed in. Oh, absolutely. And, and one thing that I, you know, want to offer. You, you folks, and I don't know, you know, we, we own that film, Flying Over America. We own all the footage for Flying Over America. And if, if, you, if you guys have needs for that film, we can, you know, offer that to you. Um, and, and I would love to work, you know, I mean, obviously there's things that need it's in Chinese right now. Um, and we have, but uh, we have a ton of footage of the national parks that we would love to share with you. I think... You know, there, there are certain restrictions still um, in, our, in our movie, you know, Grand Canyon was on the list of, of great things to see, and uh, we were able to fly uh, canyon land, uh, canyon lands and, and Moab and, and Arches and, and all of those, you know, Bryce and Zion, but we couldn't fly in the Grand Canyon. It would not let us fly in the Grand Canyon. We had an easier time getting, you know, the ability to, to fly up to the mall in Washington, D.C., right up to the edge of the presidential no-fly zone, then we, I mean, we were just absolutely denied to fly in the Grand Canyon. And we had the best pilot in the world, and we could show that he'd done it before, and all of these other things. So, you know, it wasn't for a lack of trying, uh, I think, you know, on certain levels, um, you know, it's just not as open as it could be. Thank you.